Best is Janet McNulty. If that name is familiar to you, she was a candidate for the House of Delegates, a, a seat uh, newly created, won by Larry Kump in the most recent uh, House of Delegates election. She is running for U.S. Senate. Janet, good morning. Welcome to the program again. Good morning. Thanks for having me here. Uh, what have you been up to in the uh, year or so in between elections? Mostly working really hard to stay ahead on my student loan payments. Good. And because uh, I pay my student loans. And uh, speaking of writing, I actually write and publish my own books. And mm -hmm. I published a book last summer. What was it called? It's called Entombed. It was the last book in a trilogy. Entombed? Entombed. Okay. E N T O M V E. As in buried. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you should have come on the uh, program and, and talked about your book. I should have, and that was my mistake. But yeah. I'm always available. I could always help you sell books. I do it for this guy all the time. No, nobody I'd be knew more who he than was. happy to sell more books. <laughs> nobody more, knew who he was before he came on this show. More money means more payments. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you have a tech background too, do you not? Yes, I do have a master's in IT. Right. Yes, so, and I sometimes offer IT consultantship to people, and usually free of charge. How do I stop these stupid pop-ups on this uh, computer over here? <laughs> There's actually an app you can download for that. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe after the show you can all tell us all what it is. Right? <laughs> How often is your solution, have you plugged it in? <laughs> or have you pushed the little button that turns it on? Yeah. Turn it off, turn it back on again. Yeah. Uh, Janet, let's uh, talk about reason, the reasons why you want to run for U.S. Senate. Well, mostly, I am tired of the BS I see in Congress pretty much on a daily basis. If you think about it, it's a bunch of politicians passing late night bills, like the last time the Senate passed one during the Super Bowl, when everyone's busy, and then they just expect the American people to be happy and pick up the tab. I'm tired of the entrenched political class. I'm not the only one. Most people I talk to are also tired of it. And I think we need a government that has real people in there who work real jobs. We know what it's like to juggle bills and struggle to pay bills and struggle family matters. Frankly, we're supposed to be a government of for and by the people and I don't think we are. U.S. Senate is a pretty expensive seat to try to win. I understand that. How's the fundraising going? I'm self-funded thus far. So that's a difficult one. It is a difficult one. Yeah. I've never shied away from a challenge. So how do you travel the state, get your message across to try to win a statewide election? As of right now, I take whatever free advertising I can get. I'll get on any program that wants to have me. I'll do interviews. And if I am able to drive to an event, then I drive down there. How many events have you attended so far in hyping your campaign? As of right now, none, because there have been none scheduled. Mm -hmm. But there's a couple of March I'm looking for or hoping to do, and I'm going to see if I can work it into my schedule. Have you traveled the state much to promote your campaign to this point? To this point, no, unfortunately, because I am working a full-time job. And the primary is in May. Mm, yes, May 14th. So you've got, some, you've got some driving to do. I got some driving to do, but I have a car yeah, that it, likes to drive. Is anybody helping you with your campaign right now? No. So this is you all This is me and all me. It's frankly me putting my money where my mouth is. So this is completely grassroots, as in Come, Janet McNulty. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, okay. But I do have contact information on my website, so people are more than welcome to contact me if they have questions. And what is that website? The website is McNultyWV.com. Scroll to the bottom. You will have an email address listed. Feel free to contact me at any time. I try to respond within two to three business days as quickly as I can. All right, now you can't just be against things and against people. you got to be for no, something. What are you for? that is true. <laughs> Term limits. Congressional term limits. What would they be for Senate? For the Senate, I would say at least two terms. Twelve years is more than enough time to try and get through whatever you want to get through in the U.S. Senate. And as for the House, I'm looking at no more than three terms in the House of Representatives in anyone's lifetime. Well, why give 12 years to the Senate and only six years to the House? A lot of people move from the House to the Senate and vice versa. So honestly, if you served in both chambers of Congress... Six plus 12, that's 20 years in Congress. But that's a loss of a lot of institutional knowledge, especially on the House side. I'm, I'm a big proponent of term limits. But six years, that's one senatorial term equivalent for members of the House. That's, you, you learn the bath, where the bathrooms are in the first term, right? And then in the, it just, it seems to me, it feels like an awfully short period of time. It may feel like an awfully short period of time, but are you really much more effective if you stay there longer? I mean, we have had people in our Congress for 20, 30, 40 years. Yep. Okay, so let, let's put some meat on the bones here. There, I'm casting no aspersions here at all. Politicians come on and, and 
they they love to speak speak in platitudes because mm -hmm. that's it's a short oh. period of time. That's what I you got. Understand. So here you go, a platform to do away with the or end the entrenched political class. What does it mean? How do you do it? And what's the advantage of doing so? Well, the advantage of doing so is you can get some new people, new blood, new ideas. I mean, let's face it. It's a lot of people I talk to, what they see are a bunch of the same old white haired people that have been there for a while. Yes, I understand there's institutional knowledge, but I also understand that we do need new people with fresh ideas. We have a class where it's all connections. If you're connected to other people, like connected to lobbyists or connected to other politicians, it gives you an inside, a foot in the door, so to speak. And if you have those connections, you can go wherever you want. A lot of times politicians, if they leave, not every politician does this, they might become a lobbyist or lobbyists become politicians or they decide to become party chairs or they become leaders later on. It's just one huge, for lack of a better word, it's just one huge swamp. Well, I, I worked for a lobbyist for a, a long time. I was not one, but I worked for a trade association for the scrap recycling industry. And the, the folks in the Institute of Scrap Recycling Industries, my employer, were the world's experts mm -hmm. on recycling of materials. Now, there are, there's legislation you try to get passed to benefit the recycling industry, but it was not, nobody was on the take. What they do, what lobbyists do is serve as experts in their field to, yes. to counsel politicians. Is that bad? I never said counseling was bad, and I not once accused anyone of being on the take. No, no, but okay. But, but the subtext, I, the subtext I heard about lobbyists were, it's bad that lob lobbyists become politicians and politicians become it's lobbyists. It's a double-edged sword. I didn't say all lobbyists do, but some do. Well, a great number and, of them um, do. And it's a double-edged sword. Sometimes lobbyists serve a function where they can bring light to issues, yes, and they can serve as counsels. And sometimes they don't. It really depends on who you have and who's doing the pushing. Okay. If that makes sense. By the way, uh, some people in our Facebook audience uh, resent your comment about old white-haired people, uh, by the way. I wasn't going to say anything because, you know, the whole hair thing isn't a big deal. But, you know, if you look at it. Look, when about 30 years when I have gray hair, you are more than welcome to make fun of me being an old white-haired person, okay? Mr. Miller. Um, obviously, it, it's an, an uphill battle. How do you differentiate yourself uh, other than, than not being a part of the system already that you've talked about uh, with the, 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 the people that are also running for this seat in, in uh, our current governor and, and as well uh, Alex Mooney, who is, is a, a current congressman? I'm not them. I mean, there really is no other way to put it. I am Janet McNulty. I work in retail. I watch the news when I can. I look at what's going on in my country. And in my opinion, and I know some others share this, I feel like we have people who put their ambitions ahead of everything else or they get caught up in the political sphere and they forget what's really important, and that's the country. Now, in Justice's case, he's got a lot of things in his favor. Let's face it, he's a current sitting governor. He's won two statewide elections. He did sign a massive tax cut in the law. But should he be in the Senate? I mean, that's a question we all have to ask of everybody. And I know you're asking it of me. Of course you are. The same with Mooney. He's got a lot of things in his favor. He's a current congressman. He's been in D.C. He has the experience you talk about and the knowledge you talk about. But he's been there for 10 years. We have to ask ourselves how effective has he been in those 10 years? And does he deserve a promotion to the U.S. Senate? These are questions we always have to ask of the people seeking office. And I know you are asking the same of me. So, so what is your, your vision? You know, if we, we, we wave the wand and you're now senator for, for West Virginia, what is your vision? Where do you want to take the, the, the state or the nation, really, because you're going to be one percent of of the senate at that point what is the vision other than the reverse of what we've got what's the positive message here i want americans to remember who and what we are i think we have gotten ourselves polarized we tend to pick political parties political sides and we forget one very important fact we are all americans at the end of the day it doesn't matter if you're democrat or republican we are united by the ideal of individual freedom 
the idea of equality before the law and the rule of law. This is what started this country. And we need to remember that before we lose it entirely. And as long as people start saying it, everybody, I think eventually we will reach that point. And most of the problems we have, I'm hoping, will solve themselves. And what string do you pull to make that happen? Where does it start? Because I don't think, you, I think if we got a thousand people in the room, you get a thousand people to a degree to agree that America is too polarized. And, you know, 500 would think that the other folks are idiots, right? Oh, yeah. And uh, so, so somebody has, somebody has to start the knitting process to bring this together. If you win, you have the position and the bully pulpit to make that happen. How? One person at a time. You just talk to people. I talk to them every day in my everyday life or when I just go out shopping. You listen to them, you listen to their concerns, you treat them with respect. In return, they will treat you with respect. And I'm hoping that at some point they will realize that we have more in common than we do differences. Yes, I know, you put two people in a room and you can easily start a fight. It's not that hard. It is a lot harder to get people to see eye to eye on things. It starts with one person at a time, with each and every one of us agreeing that we are going to try to find something in common rather than automatically calling someone an idiot just because we have a disagreement. Janet McNulty is our guest, candidate for U.S. Senate. Uh, a couple of years ago, ran for the newly created 94th House seat uh, election, ultimately won by Larry Kump. So you touched on this a bit, Janet, but let's get into a little bit more. Are you the type of politician where it's all or nothing, or are you a compromiser? As much as you love to be an all or nothing, there's a time and a place when you have to compromise and a time and a place where you don't. It really depends on the issue at hand. It depends on the legislation that's up. You can't always be a my way or the highway kind of person. Had you been in the Senate for the recent border bill controversy that went through, where would you have been? The Senate bill that came through gives more money to foreign countries. It doesn't pay much attention to the border itself, so I would not have voted for it. Because America first, though we hear that a lot from a lot of especially Republican candidates, it's not a slogan, it's a promise. And the $100 billion to Ukraine and Israel? No, they've gotten enough money. Ukraine is an independent nation, Israel is an independent nation, and it's time for independent nations to start funding themselves. America needs to look to ourselves, our own problems, and start putting ourselves first. And we see a lot of bills just like this that are coupling multiple things together in order to gain the votes needed to get things passed. Are you in favor of that, or would you rather see things go through on an individual basis? I would rather see them go through on an individual basis. When you start coupling things together, you end up with these 2,300-page behemoths. The Obamacare Act was definitely a very long one, and the, I think the infrastructure bill that came through it was a lot of things pieced together because they were trying to get something through at the end of the day what you end up with is a massive bill that either no one can read so we don't know what's in it till after it's passed and i don't agree with pelosi that we have to pass the bill to know what's in it and you end up spending a lot of money and no accounting as to where that money goes hmm. individual bills that's really how it should be each item each subject should be debated be considered in full the Ukraine and Israel votes are fascinating to me on several different levels here. So Putin has already made the statement that in his lifetime, the greatest tragedy was the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And it is his stated goal to reassemble the Soviet Union that he knew mm -hmm. as a happy little Vladimir Putin kid, right? And this is what he wants to do. And he's going to do it one country at a time if the rest of the world lets him. Much the way Hitler marched through Europe into Africa and uh, into Russia as the mm -hmm. rest of the world let him. And I see a similar pattern here. Do you think it's in the United States' best interest to allow Putin to reestablish the Soviet Union and put the band back together again? Because that's what he wants to do. The big question is, is Putin really going to succeed? The other question we got to ask ourselves, are we prepared for a war? Because that will happen. Putin has shown no cowardice when it comes to fighting. He is willing to go all in. Is he is, more vulnerable with a reunified Soviet Union behind him or right now? Because he's not putting the Soviet Union back together again just to be able to hold all the cards and say, oh, look, I, look I got more property. I don't think Putin is vulnerable now at all. Russia has their own manufacturing. They have oil reserves. They are not afraid to use what resources they have. They have strengthened their military, and Russians actually have national pride as a whole. 
in our country, thanks to Biden, we do not drill for oil or coal. We have weakened ourselves economically. We have weakened ourselves militarily. You have to ask, because this is what's going to happen if we push Putin into a corner. Are we prepared to go all in, and are we prepared to fight a war? Are you prepared for Putin to put the Soviet Union back together? Because as a senator, these are the questions you have to ask when you're voting on funding. True. I think we have to ask ourselves, is Putin putting the Soviet Union back together? Is he really putting together a communist nation? Or is he, in his words just reunifying the Russian people. No, he's a dictator. Oh, I know that. He's He's he's, ex-KGB. He's he's putting the whole thing back together so he can have his puppets in place like he does already in a couple of the other satellite nations he's already overrun. True. But will we be safe with another Soviet Union? No. But will we be safe if we declare war or push someone into a war when we are ill-prepared to fight ourselves? No. I think he's already pushed that, don't you think? He's pushing, but trust me, he has not gone as far as he can. And in regards to Israel, so you would pull aid to Israel entirely? I think at this point in time, we need to start considering it. Israel has money. They are not broke. They are able to fund themselves. And we can't keep giving everything we have to another country. We can't continually keep doing that when ours is wide open to an invasion and we can't even afford to pay Social Security or Medicare or even take care of our vets. I mean, let's face it, we're broke as a nation. We are trillions of dollars in debt, 34 trillions of dollars of debt. At some point, the bottom is going to fall out and we'll be unable to give the money anyways. So you, you brought it up. We don't have a whole lot of time left, but let's get to it. The biggest cause of deficit spending in this country is entitlement programs. So yes. Security, Medicare, it's difficult to address those because as soon as you bring it up, the other side immediately pushes grandma over the cliff in the wheelchair. <laughs> yes, says, I know. Says you're trying I've, to push her. I've seen those commercials. Trust me. So as I'm a senator, how do you her. deal with it? How do you how do you fiscally stabilize Social Security and Medicare? Well, Social Security used to be a trust fund when it was first established by FDR. It was an actual trust fund. The money you put in there, it stayed there. We need to return it to that. It got robbed in the '60s for LBJ's Great Society program and War on Poverty. We need to make Social Security the trust fund again. That means whatever money is taken out of your paycheck and put in the Social Security fund, it has to go into an actual fund that is not touched for anything else but is strictly used for Social Security payments. It's not going to be an easy thing to do because it's been drained for decades, but I think it can be done over time. But that in and of itself won't stabilize Social Security because there's not enough people paying in to be able to pay out all the benefits that are promised to the people who are still alive and living longer. This is true, which means the government is going to have to look to make cuts somewhere. It's an unfortunate reality that we have put ourselves in. Are you in favor of increasing Social Security taxes? I don't think increasing taxes alone is really going to do anything, because you said yourself, not enough people are paying into the system. I think we're just going to have to look at making actual cuts in other places where we spend money. You mean in, in cuts to Social Security payments to seniors? Not cuts to Social Security payments. Well, the rest of the budget, discretionary spending, once you eliminate the, de- the Defense Department, is about 17%. There's not a whole lot of money there to make enough cuts to stabilize Social Security and Medicare without doing something to Social Security and Medicare. What are you going to do? Well, we could look into cutting federal fin- funding to education and returning control of education to the states. We spend about... Would you completely eliminate the Federal Department of Education? In the end, I would like to see that, yes. Why? We never needed it. The Federal Department of Education came into existence under the Carter years. Um, Because of it, most of what the schools do, I mean, it's basically an overreaching education um, department. What they do is they send out a list of what they want the local schools to do. It goes to states, the states send it to the counties. If you want federal funds, you almost, in the end, have to do whatever the Federal Department of Education wants. We don't need it. Education can be controlled at the state and local level. Each state has their own board of education or their own department of education, depending on which state you live in. Each state is perfectly capable of funding their own schools. We do not need to be dependent upon the government. We had a federal department of education once in the 1800s, and they eliminated it within a couple of years because, or a few years, because they concluded 
that it put too much power in the hands of the federal government and education, if you want education, is best done at the local level. If we eliminated federal funding for education, what would happen to schools in West Virginia? I didn't say eliminate. I said we may have to look into cutting. Schools in West Virginia, <coughs> you might have to, well, we have the school choice program, the voucher program that was started. We might have to look into privatizing. Make it where the money follows the child. So whatever school parents choose to send their kids to, that's the school that gets the bulk of the money. The money will follow the child. Whatever schools parents believe are failing their children, well, if the money doesn't follow the child, you know, they don't get money because the child's not there, then they will have to find another way to earn money. Janet, on that note, we are just about out of time. Ten seconds. How can people find out more about your campaign? www.mcnultywv.com. M-C-N-U-L-T-Y. Yes. All right. Good stuff. Good job. Thank you.